uh, it's so nice to meet you. Uh, I hope you're having a nice stay here in Spain because I watched the photo, of course, yesterday in El Prado. I just wanted to tell you that uh, my flatmate works there and they were also happy. Oh, <laughs> they were great. They were wonderful. And the, the Javier and uh, Cecilia, the, the two people I was being taken, who was taking care of me, they were fantastic and their knowledge. And I, I had such respect and such admiration for them. And, and the Prado has become really an extraordinary museum. You know, I, I was saying before that when I first came here in 1971, you know, the Prado was, it was the Franco's time, and the Prado was very neglected. You know, it was dark, you couldn't see the paintings, you know. I mean, <laughs> the black paintings were really black. <laughs> you know, his black paintings were very black. And I go, they're so black, I can't see anything. But now, over the years, and to see it now, I mean, it's it's a truly, truly magnificent museum, and they've it's come to itself yeah. finally. Yeah. Yeah, I love going there. I think they have done an amazing job. There. Yeah. So okay, well, let's talk about the rich people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have been in the show business for like a lot, of, a lot of time, uh -huh. and uh, sure, you probably have met a few of them. Uh, I would like to know. Where is the point where they become like so stupid, so out of their reality? And well, I think it's what it does. You know, it, it, you know, you have to be, you have to keep in touch. Well, you don't have to do anything. Actually, that's the truth of the matter. People don't. But if you're an artist, if you're somebody who, like an actor, you have to have a sense of what the world is. And you have to understand where people marginalize themselves. And the rich people have done that. They marginalize themselves, so they're not in touch. And, you know, Elon Musk can hide behind the fact that he's autistic, but he's actually not being very kind to autism. You know, he is actually being, I think, stupid, you know, and that's not autistic, that's just stupidity. And, uh, you know, and his whole handling of the Twitter thing and what have you. So you see and how he is so inured to what is around him. And they're all the same, you know, the, and the, the Trump. I mean, look at Trump. Look at the fantasy world that Trump lives in. I mean, he's, he's crazy. The man should be put in an asylum and taken care of and given electric shock treatment so that he's, you know, he's gets his brain back because it's gone. He's gone. He's a fucking idiot, you know. And that's where it does, you know. It, 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 the, not everybody. I mean, there are people who know how to use their wealth. I mean, Gates, in many ways, has used his wealth incredibly well. And there is his sense of the world is, you know, pretty good. I mean, he has his own problems, his personal problems, his domestic problems, which are you know, not my interest. But what he's done, I can understand, and I say, see it. There's a positiveness. And also, he's, he understands the dilemma that's going on. And then, you know, I think there comes a point when you're so wealthy for so long, you just don't even think about it anymore. You know, we, we have now, in England, we have uh, the head of Starbucks, um, you know, that, uh, well, it's not in England, it's in the States. So he's before a, a, a committee now, and he's union busting. They're accusing him of union busting. I did this documentary where I interviewed this young man who's trying to set up a union in Amazon, you know, and he has to stay outside, and it's... And I understand that because these workers are exploited, you know, because, and they're very, and they're making a fortune. Starbucks makes a fortune, Amazon makes a fortune. Now, of course, it is the vision of one man that's done it. And I don't, I don't want to discredit any of that, you know, Bezos had a vision and he's made it. But it's the sense of reality, the sense of proportion of where you are in the world. And... Sadly, that goes in certain cases. Not everybody, but it does go, and I think it makes... And, of course, our show is absolutely about that. That's what it's about. It's about how they are distant from the world. And, interestingly enough, it's what uh, Logan is aware of. He knows that. He knows... I mean, he's gone down a road that he's chosen. It's a road that he's not happy with. But it's the road, and it's his business, and it's this, and it's this thing of, you know, he does say, I win, you know, because it's my vision. And that's what has been, that's his MO, that's his, well, it's his MV, it's his modus, modus vivandi, you know, that he, he wants, he, he, that's how he's run the, his world. But then he comes a cropper with these children who, 
are ridiculous, you know, because they are all sort of spoilt in one sense, and and it's tragic too to see human beings in that. And you see it with uh, Jeremy's character, what he goes through, the pain he goes through. Um, it's awful, you know. Um, the, the the accident, the killing of the boy, and the and the and, and, and the car, you know, the, the the drugs, and you know, I mean, that thing is just, it's he's damned from the one go, and he can't get back on board, you know, he's fallen off and he can't get back on board, and his father thinks, well, I can hold him and I can put him in position, but then he will stupidly manipulate him, and that's what you shouldn't do. And Logan is stupid in that way. <sighs> <laughs> no, I love that answer. I really agree with you. Do you think that it comes for the money? This corruption comes strictly for the money? Or is it about the power? That <laughs> well, I think the power is a manifestation of the money. Right. You know, without the money, you don't have the power mm -hmm. in this situation. I mean, there's a different kind of power that you, you that people have who don't need that kind of money. They have power in their own inner belief, you know. Uh, I think I think Logan is bereft of a lot of stuff. He's a lonely man. He's a fundamentally an unhappy man. He is a misanthrope, you know. He doesn't like life, and he has contempt for his fellow human being. And that manifests itself in the right wing of his press. He just says that everybody's out to grab what they can, both hands and run. And he talks about the market. It's the market. The market is this. Now, I don't believe in any of that shit. I think it's all bollocks, the whole lot. But it's what, it's these belief systems, you know, avarice, money, they're belief systems that don't feed you, don't actually nourish you. They end up, they marginalize you and they take everything away from you. So you end up a kind of creature, you know, so it's, it's tricky. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I also agree. Now let's talk about the industry itself, because I've read that you said you're happy that uh, Succession is ending now, even if HBO may not be happy because, uh, you know, like Game of Thrones and... Well, I, I, I think, in, in fairness to HBO, HBO have really had, I mean, that's the great thing. That's what makes HBO very special. And I don't want it to lose its specialness. It's under a lot of threat at the moment because of, you know, what's been, what companies taking over, but it mustn't lose what it's been and the standard that it's created over the years. And it's, and actually the, the creators, you know, the, our creative team at the HBO have been very good about letting the show go. You know, they've not tried to falsely or blackmail, you know, they understand they understand, they, because Jesse is so intelligent and so smart, and they understand that the nature of the show is finite. It's not infinite. And that's the key to, to Jesse's thinking, that he knew that he would have to bring it to some kind of conclusion, you know, and that's what he's done. And, uh, and I think it was tough, and I think he was... And it was, it was also quite sad for him, quite painful probably, to bring this to a close. But I think he needs to do it because he needs to go on, you know. He's done this show for, only this show, for the last nine years, you know, even before you think of a couple of years in preparation. So I think he, as a writer, he's too good just to have stuck with the succession as the one subject. I mean, he, and these other st stuff has been so wonderful, and in the thick of it, and the peep show, these things he's created, and they're excellent shows. And Jesse's have got a lot more to give with different stories, and he should be allowed to embrace these different stories. Yeah, makes it very interesting. Uh, yesterday at the Academia de Cine, you said uh, something that I really liked, that it was that cinema has forgotten the relation between image and words. Yeah. So um, I would like you to explain that. Well, it has. You know, I, my, I'm, I come from a whole tradition of the writer and serving the writer. And the best ideas are the best written things. And I think that when, when, uh, you know, when cinema moved to sound, that's what they started to embrace. And they used to have people, uh, and the, 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 you know, the powers that be, the Xanax and the Louis B. Mayers and the Sam Goldwins. They would have 
writers on call, you know, who would do passes and maybe write a section like, and they had William Faulkner, they had uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, they had these great, Dorothy Parker, they had these great writers who did, the, you know, the most amazing, amazing work, but they didn't even work, sometimes they didn't write a whole film, they weren't part of it. And the writers is uh, 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 what I think is the key. That was my relationship. So the word and the image was very well matched up in the 30s. You see those films like Mr. Deed, those Capra films. There is a sense of the vision and the word coming together. Even in John Ford, that happened. And that's what I think that the the the... Marvel family, they, they, it's understandable because there, there is the those films, or those stories are, they work best when they're allegorical, when they, we can relate them to our own lives, which is probably why I like, um, you know, uh, X Men Two. X Men Two is a very good example of that because it's Brian Singer talking about his own sense of being gay uh, in a world where it's more acceptable then than it was many, many years ago. So he writes about that, and it's in an allegory of those, what the X-Men were. They were people who were outside the modern, so that allegorically works, and it's well written, and it makes, it brings all the things together. But a lot of them don't have that attention to detail. They're so busy doing fights and crashes and booms and bangs and everything else, and all the, all the tricks of cinema, that they forget about the word. They forget about, you know, that the idea that something is really thought about and considered and, and about who we are. And that's what I feel cinema's lacking.